It's a beautiful summer's day in January here in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, this is Sam Burkholz. I'm here with Trolig Kyabyon uh, the founder of the Kagyu Avam Buddhist Institute and a, a very special uh, teacher in the Karma Kagyu lineage uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, Joanne and Walter Fordham have asked me to interview Rinpoche and to uh, uh, see what he has to say about a few things. Good morning, yes. Rinpoche. Good morning, Sam. Um, Rinpoche, as Dharma becomes more established in the West, uh, do you think that there's a danger of, of selectively modernizing the path to make it more palatable for Westerners? Uh, for example, the teachings on karma and rebirth? Um, yes, I think um, there's, uh, there is that danger. Um, I think um, sometimes uh, uh, modern Buddhists tend to um, uh, think that uh, learning about Buddhist history and uh, even Buddhist um, um, philosophy, uh, psychology and so forth uh, in depth is not really all that necessary. What is necessary is the Buddhist practice of meditation. And uh, through meditation, then uh, everything that Buddhist uh, um, uh, teachings uh, speak about uh, can be um, um, realized uh, within one's own um, mental continuum. And I think uh, um, approaching Buddhism um, that way uh, can be uh, very uh, dangerous because uh, one is simply relying on one's own experiences to guide one's spiritual path um, uh, without any kind of uh, external uh, reference point uh, in relation to a teacher, in relation to a, a clearly formulated uh, system of uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, thought. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think it's a very sort of uh, uh, subjectively indulgent kind of approach, and I think uh, there's a lot of danger in that. Uh, thank you, Rinpoche. Uh, also, do you think there's, there, there might be a danger of Western practitioners just trying to imitate uh, uh, Tibetan culture or uh, Asian culture in their uh, relationship to the Buddhist teachings? Well, there's that, um, that's the other extreme, and that also uh, spells uh, disaster uh, in another way. Uh, and, um, and there are, you know, sort of uh, uh, Western Buddhists uh, who try to uh, uh, emulate or imitate uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist teachers, uh, even down to uh, uh, sort of speaking uh, pidgin English and so on. Um, uh, and sort of uh, wearing Tibetan um, uh, dresses and uh, whatnot. And I think, uh, you know, that's going the other extreme. And uh, one doesn't have to sort of uh, uh, learn about uh, Tibetan culture. What one needs to learn is the uh, Tibetan form of Buddhism uh, or any kind, other kind of uh, Buddhism that one may be interested in, Japanese, Theravadan, etc. Um, but uh, uh, there, you know, it's a delicate issue because um, uh, I actually do not uh, think that uh, uh, different forms of Buddhism can be completely uh, sort of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, separated from uh, the uh, 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 sort of uh, cultural uh, receptacle. So Tibetan uh, Buddhism will have something uh, Tibetan about it, and Japanese Buddhism will have something Japanese about it. Uh, I don't think that in itself is a problem. Uh, I think the problem uh, arises when one starts to sort of uh, 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 import uh, certain Tibetan uh, cultural practices. Um, I think uh, you know, uh, cultural practices, social practices, uh, those things, uh, those kinds of uh, um, accretions are uh, not necessary, and and they can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, pruned away. Thank you, Rupchay. Okay. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> do you have any views on how the, the uh, particularly the Kagyu and Nyingma lineages of Tibetan Buddhism uh, can be brought forward purely in the West and completely in the West for, for the Western practitioner? Yes, um, I think uh, that is the uh, uh, sort of uh, um, aim uh, th that we should all be aiming uh, towards. And that is, uh, you know, uh, by um, uh, studying Kajun Nyingma teachings um, uh, in relation to Tibetan Buddhism, and then uh, uh, planting that Tibetan Buddhist tradition uh, in the West, in Western context, uh, so that uh, the Kaju and Nyingma traditions, as they develop, uh, as they mature uh, in the Western context, uh, then uh, would reflect uh, uh, something uh, about the uh, Western sort of uh, uh, mentality, Western approach, uh, Western values, and so forth, uh, in the uh, in the way in which uh, these traditions then um, uh, begin to take root. And I think that is very uh, important as well. So um, even though uh, when these teachings are brought into uh, the West, um, there, there's something about Tibetan, uh, about these traditions, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but when, once it starts, once these teachings begin to uh, take root, then I think, you know, um, uh, they can then begin to assume a certain uh, Western quality. Uh, as the traditions begin to get mature. And I think that's a good thing. Yes, Rupert Chair. Thank you. Uh, many of us know that you've uh, listened to many of the uh, uh, talks that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche gave while he was uh, in the, uh, North, uh, on the North American continent and, and in Britain. And uh, we also know that you're familiar with his writings. Uh, could you uh, talk about uh, the way that you see he presented Dharma, whether it was a, tradi a, a, a traditional Kagyu Nyingma style or, or something different? Yes, um, <clears throat> um, early on, um, the, especially in the um, uh, 80s, uh, I uh, began to uh, listen to many of uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, uh, tapes. Um, and um, I found them to be uh, extremely uh, uh, useful and beneficial uh, because um, um, you see um, he had sort of uh, forged a, a new path uh, in terms of how to uh, teach Tibetan Buddhism to Westerners and I found that to be very refreshing. I never you know uh, imitated the Trungpa Rinpoche style by the way um, because, you know, uh, I'm not Trungpa Rinpoche, and uh, even though um, I'm very familiar with uh, many of, uh, many of uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, unique expressions and so forth, uh, I've never used those in my teachings. And uh, my uh, style of teaching is very different, and, uh, and he was, uh, uh, he was a, a poet uh, and, uh, and a very sort of artistic kind of uh, um, the person, uh, whereas I think I'm sort of more uh, academic, and uh, and my approach has also, you know, sort of in terms of teaching and things like that, it's been more like that. Um, um, but uh, nevertheless, I found his teachings to be very beneficial because, uh, um, you see, uh, when he was uh, teaching uh, Buddhism, uh, he started to teach Buddhism by instructing people in the practice of meditation. Uh, uh, and that is quite unique because uh, uh, usually uh, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, people would uh, immediately go into tantric practices. Um, and uh, so they would be given uh, tantric uh, abhisheka or empowerments and uh, would be given certain tantric sadhana or tantric uh, practice manuals to follow. Uh, and you know uh, recite mantras and things like that, but he was completely against that. You know, so he sort of uh, <clears throat> excuse me uh, presented um, Tibetan Buddhism in a very sort of uh, systematic fashion, uh, and that's how it should be practiced anyway. You know, because uh, uh, 
Tibetan Buddhism um, uh, consists of the three yana system or three vehicle system. So it makes sense to uh, uh, sort of approach um, Tibetan Buddhism in that graduated way, you know, first meditation um, and then, you know, sort of becoming familiar with the uh, uh, Mahayana concepts and then uh, gradually entering into the tantric practices. Uh, might you want to comment on the way that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche taught the Vajrayana to Western students? Yes, um, I think uh, the, the way he uh, taught uh, Vajrayana, uh, as far as I could see, was that uh, <clears throat> he brought some kind of uh, notion of uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen, uh, along with uh, traditional tantric practices. Uh, well, you know, with this concept of uh, basic sanity and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, um, so uh, he introduced a lot of uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen concepts without saying that they are Mahamudra uh, uh, or Dzogchen concepts. Uh, so uh, the tantric practices that he introduced is actually sort of uh, um, uh, enveloped by the uh, sort of general uh, atmosphere of uh, uh, Mahamudra or Dzogchen type of uh, approach. Oh, thank you so much, Rupaji. Okay. Um, can you uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the relationship one has with one's root guru or root teacher when the guru is no longer uh, in uh, the physical body in Rupakaya? Yes, um, well, uh, the thing is, uh, one, ha one should be uh, relating to the guru uh, in relation to what we call three uh, bodies or three embodiments of the Buddha, you know, Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Dharmakaya. So um, even though the Nirmanakaya aspect is no longer sort of uh, apparent, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, in Sambhogakaya form and Dharmakaya form, uh, the guru is uh, ever present, and so uh, um, you know, uh, dharmakaya uh, has to be uh, sort of uh, related to in relation to one's own uh, genuine, authentic state of being, uh, and to connect with one's guru on that level. And with sambhogakaya, when you're doing guru yoga, or you know, when you're praying to your guru, and when you're thinking about your guru, remembering your guru remembering Guru's kindness, etc. And when you're uh, sort of feeling some kind of longing or when you're feeling some kind of uh, closeness to your Guru, then you, uh, you invoke the Guru in Sambhogakaya form. And, uh, and then the Guru might appear in the Sambhogakaya form, uh, even in dreams and uh, uh, visions and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, you actually have to invoke your Guru uh, in a, uh, in uh, you know, sort of uh, with a form, uh, and uh, and that's uh, referred to as sambhogakaya. Oh, thank you, Rupshe. Yes, very helpful. What had you heard about uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's teachings in the West while you were a, a monk in Rumtek? Uh, were his activities and teachings influential influential in terms of your development as a teacher, for example? Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, when uh, uh, His Holiness the Kamapa returned uh, from his 1977 uh, world tour, um, Jambu Kongtu was in the, in the um, um, group uh, that traveled with uh, uh, His Holiness, and, uh, and Jambu Kongtu brought back some of uh, Trungpa um, seminary transcripts. And one of the transcripts that he brought back was uh, on uh, Four Dhammas of Kampopa. And, uh, 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 you know, I used to go and visit Jambu uh, Kongdu uh, quite a lot in those days. And, um, and he gave me a copy, you know, of uh, um, Four Dhammas of Kampopa. And, uh, and I was very sort of uh, excited to have the copy because it was not like a traditional sort of... Uh, um, presentation of the four dhammas. You know, his approach was completely different, 
And it took me uh, quite a long time to actually sort of uh, even get a very sort of uh, um, uh, some kind of, uh, um, you know, sort of tangible idea as to, you know, what he was trying to get at. Uh, because the language, you know, his use of language was so uh, unique and so uh, different. So, uh, um, uh, so um, uh, I mean, through reading his, um, you know, sort of transcripts and things like that uh, back in uh, uh, Sikkim, uh, I uh, realized he was a very, very uh, sort of uh, unique uh, teacher, and uh, and I was uh, sort of uh, very interested in uh, uh, knowing more about him. But uh, apart from that, uh, the, um, uh, the people who traveled with him, you know, when I uh, sort of spoke to them about Trungpa uh, they were very impressed by uh, his organizational skill. Uh, I remember hearing that. And uh, um, as far as the uh, sort of Trungpa uh, uh, uh outrageous behavior and things like that, uh, they never said anything, um, and uh, they, they actually uh, thought, uh, you know, the uh, Dharma Datu centers, as they were known uh, in those days, uh, the Shambhala centers, were very well run and very uh, well organized, and uh, and everybody was very well looked after. Um, that's what they told me, and uh, and uh, that uh, the uh, students were very serious. Uh, about Dharma, and they were not just dabbling in it, but uh, uh, people were doing, you know, sort of a serious uh, Dharma practice uh, on a regular basis. Um, and the centers were very, uh, you know, large and many students and so on. Uh, so I think, uh, by and large, they were very impressed. Oh, wonderful. Um, there are many people who have, uh, who never met Chagyam Trungpa Rinpoche, but feel a very strong spiritual connection with them. Um, how far can they go with that connection that they make through Trungpa Rinpoche's books and through, through his talks and, and so on? I think uh, a lot because, you know, um, uh, you see, um, um, uh, teacher lives through uh, uh, his or her teachings. Um, so, uh, um, you know, it's like uh, uh, the Buddha is no more, Buddha Shakyamuni is no more, but his teachings uh, live on and his teachings continue to uh, guide, uh, you know, uh, millions of people um, and uh, still, uh, you know, sort of vibrant and, uh, and very much alive. Um, so in a similar fashion, you know, uh, uh, even uh, just uh, sort of uh, um, uh, our immediate teachers and so on, uh, you know, their teachings, uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, substitute, if you like, uh, uh, for the uh, living uh, teacher. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, extremely important. Huh? I mean, and uh, the uh, benefit of the teachings will uh, continue to uh, uh, impact uh, on people and, uh, uh, and uh, the value of the teachings really cannot be uh, underestimated. And that's sort of related to what I was saying um, earlier in terms of uh, people's resistant, uh, resistance towards uh, sort of uh, learning more about uh, Buddhist philosophy and things like that. Because if people did that, then uh, they would get more benefit from the teachings. Um, you know, um, uh, because um, uh, the Buddhist, uh, what Buddhism teaches, you know, a lot of the philosophy is actually, uh, even now, you know, is very current. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, sort of uh, your, um, the reading uh, about things that have no longer any relevance, you know. The modern world view has superseded uh, the world views that are presented in Buddhist teachings, so we no longer need them. I think uh, some people who have, have not really looked into Buddhist teachings properly have that view. They think that as far as, you know, um, uh, our sort of uh, uh, conception of the world that we live in and how we should live our lives and the values we should cultivate and so on, uh, modern world can do that for us. What Buddhism uh, can teach is how to do meditation, how to go in, deeper into oneself. That's the only thing that Buddhism has to offer. Um, 
uh, intellectually and in every other way, modern, um, uh, modern view is far superior. So we have no uh, need for uh, the uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, teachings, you know, to inform us of uh, what the world is like, what, the real, what reality is, uh, what is the best way to conduct our lives, uh, and what sort of values should be cultivated, and so on. Thank you so much, Rep. Jay, for uh, <laughs> providing this interview for the yes. Chronicles, and I'm sure uh, it will be welcomed very much. You're welcome, Samji. Thank you. <laughs>